Hello and welcome to Mahatma Gandhi Letters. Dear listeners, let's straight away get into the third part of the article called Open Letter by Gandhi, which was written during 1894 December in South Africa. It says, In order to answer the third question, is their present treatment in accordance with the best British traditions, or with the principles of justice and morality, or with the principles of Christianity? It will be necessary to inquire what their treatment is. I think it will be readily granted that the Indian is bitterly hated in the colony. The man in the street hates him, curses him, spits upon him, and often pushes him off the footpath. The press cannot find a sufficiently strong word in the best English dictionary to damn him with. Here are a few samples. The real canker that is eating into the very vitals of the community. These parasites, wily, wretched, semi-barbarous Asiatics, a thing black and lean and a long way from clean, which they call the accursed Hindu. He is chock full of vice and he lives upon rice. I heartily cuss the Hindu. Squalid coolies with truthless tongues and artful ways. The press almost unanimously refuses to call the Indian by his proper name. He is Ram Sami. He is Mr. Sami. He is Mr. Cooley. He is the black man. And these offensive epithets have become so common that they, at any rate one of them, Cooley, are used even in the sacred precincts of the courts, as if the Cooley were the legal and proper name to give to any and every Indian. The public men, too, seem to use the word freely. I have often heard the painful expression, coolly clerk, from the mouths of men who ought to know better. The expression is a contradiction in terms and is extremely offensive to those to whom it is applied. But then, in this colony, the Indian is a creature without feelings. The tram cars are not for the Indians. The railway officials may treat the Indians as beasts. No matter how clean, his very sight is such an offense to every white man in the colony that he would object to sit even for a short time, in the same compartment with the Indian. The hotels shut their doors against them. I know instances of respectable Indians having been denied a night's lodging in an hotel. Even the public baths are not for the Indians, no matter who they are. If I am to depend upon one-tenth of the reports that I have received with regard to the treatment of the indentured Indians on the various estates, it would form a terrible indictment against the humanity of the masters on the estates and the care taken by the protector of Indian immigrants. This, however, is a subject which my extremely limited experience of it precludes me from making further remarks upon. The vagrant law is needlessly oppressive and often puts respectable Indians in a very awkward position. Add to this the rumors that are rife in the air to the effect that they should be made or induced to live in locations. It may be merely an intention. Nonetheless, it is an index of the feeling of the European colonists against the Indians. I beseech you to picture to yourself the state the Indian would be in in Natal if it were possible to carry out all such intentions. Now, is this treatment in consonance with, with the British traditions of justice or morality or Christianity? I would, with your permission, quote an extract from Macaulay and leave it to you to answer the question as to whether the present treatment would have met with his approval. Speaking on the subject of the treatment of the Indians, he expressed the following sentiments. We shall never consent to administer the pusta to a whole community to stupefy and paralyze a great people whom God has committed to our charge for the wretched purpose of rendering them more amenable to our control. What is that power worth which is founded on vice, on ignorance, and on misery, which we can hold by violating the most sacred duties, which as governors we owe to the governed, which as a people, blessed with far more than an ordinary measure of political liberty and of intellectual light, we owe to a race debased by three thousand years of despotism and priestcraft. We are free, we are civilized, to little purpose, if we grudge to any portion of the human race an equal measure of freedom and civilization. I have but to refer you to writers like Mill, Burke, Bright, and Fawcett, to further show that they, at any rate, would not give countenance to the treatment accorded to the Indians in the colony. To bring a man here on starvation wages, to hold him under bondage, and when he shows the least signs of liberty, or is in a position to live less miserably, to wish to send him back to his home, 
where he would become comparatively a stranger and perhaps unable to earn a living, is hardly a mark of fair play or justice characteristic of the British nation. That the treatment of the Indians is contrary to the teaching of Christianity needs hardly any argument. The man who taught us to love our enemies and to give our cloak to the one who wanted the coat and to hold out the right cheek when the left was smitten and who swept away the distinction between the Jew and the Gentile would never brook a disposition that causes a man to be so proud of himself as to consider himself polluted even by the touch of a fellow being. The last head of the inquiry has, I believe, been sufficiently discussed in discussing the first. And I for one would not be much grieved if an experiment were tried to drive out each and every Indian from the colony. In that case, I have not the slightest doubt that the colonists would soon rue the day when they took the step and would wish they had not done it. The petty trades and the petty avocations of life would be left alone. The work for which they are specially suited would not be taken up by the Europeans, and the colony would lose an immense amount of revenue now derived from the Indians. The climate of South Africa is not such as was would enable the Europeans to do the work that they can easily do in Europe. What, however, I do submit with the greatest deference is this, that if the Indians must be kept in the colony, then let them receive such treatment as by their ability and integrity they may be fit to receive. That is to say, give them what is their due, and what is the least that a sense of justice, unalloyed by partiality or prejudice, should prompt you to give them. It now remains for me only to implore you to give this matter your earnest consideration, and to remind you, here I mean especially the English, that Providence has put the English and the Indians together, and has placed in the hands of the former the destinies of the latter, and it will largely depend upon what every Englishman does with respect to the Indian and how he treats him, whether the putting together will result in an everlasting union brought about by broad sympathy, love, free mutual intercourse, and also a right knowledge of the Indian character, or whether the putting together will simply last so long as the English have sufficient resources to keep the Indians under check and the naturally mild Indians have not been vexed into active opposition to the foreign yoke. I have further to remind you that the English in England have shown by their writings, speeches and deeds that they mean to unify the hearts of the two peoples, that they do not believe in color distinctions, and that they will raise India with them rather than rise upon its ruin. In support of this, I beg to refer you to Bright, Fawcett, Bradloff, Gladstone, Wedderburn, Pincott, Ripon, Rie, Northbrook, Dufferin, and a host of other eminent Englishmen who represent public opinion. The very fact of an English constituency returning an Indian to the British House of Commons, in spite of the expressed wish to the contrary of the then Prime Minister, and almost the whole British press, both conservative and liberal, congratulating the Indian member on the success and expressing its approval of the unique event, and the whole house again, both conservative and liberal, according him a warm welcome. This fact alone, I submit, supports my statement. Will you then follow them, or will you strike out a new path? Will you promote unity, which is the condition of progress, or will you promote discord, which is the condition of degradation? In conclusion, I beg of you to receive the above in the same spirit in which it has been written. I have the honor to remain your obedient servant, M. K. Gandhi. Dear listeners, this is the article called Open Letter, written by Gandhi, and the pamphlet was printed at the Natal Mercury Steam Printing Works, Durban. Thank you for listening to Mahatma Gandhi Letters.